We're very fortunate to have Kathy Warden, who is the uh, chairman, CEO, and president of Northrop Grumman here. Um, briefly, uh, her background, she is from, I'm from a native of Maryland, but I had never heard of, to be honest, her hometown of Smithburg, uh, Maryland. Anybody know where Smithburg is? It's somebody, around at least somebody. It's near near Hagerstown, right? <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, she's from Smithburg, and uh, from there she went to James Madison University and got her MBA at George Washington. She started her career at General Electric, then went Viridian, then her General Dynamics, and then in 2008 she joined Northrop Grumman, and she worked her way up to be uh, President and Chief Operating Officer. And in January of 2019, she became the uh, CEO. And in January and in July of 2019, also added the title of chairman. And uh, since she and all of you will wish you had bought the stock when she became the CEO, because the stock is up 84% uh, since she became the uh, CEO and the market capitalization is up about 65%. The company has about uh, market capitalization of about $70 billion and about 90,000 employees and headquartered in Falls Church. So how many people, when they heard she was gonna be the CEO, bought the stock? Okay. How many people wish they had bought the stock? I told David it's not too late. Right, okay. <laughs> so um, recently, um, you were banned from traveling to Russia. Has that upset you very much? And have you lost a lot of sleep out of that? Or were you going to Russia a lot? Well, after having to replan my vacation for this summer, just kidding. Uh, no, I had not planned any travel to Russia and it hasn't upset me. As a matter of fact, it's made me proud because the reason I am banned from travel to Russia is because of the work Northrop Grumman does. And we are providing capabilities that the US and our allies use to deter conflict. And when that's not successful as it hasn't been in Ukraine to protect people's human rights and their freedoms and way of life. So that's something to be very proud of. Okay. And were you surprised that you were on the list or? I, I was surprised because the sanctions against me don't really accomplish anything, okay. but uh, it's part of the job. Okay. So uh, let's talk about Russia, Ukraine. I assume that Northrop Grumman is providing some equipment to the Ukrainians. Is that true? It is true. And how does that work where do the Ukrainians call you directly and say, this is what we need? Or did the Pentagon call you and say, what do you have that we could use? Or how does that work? Well, the Ukrainians don't have my cell phone number. So no, right. they don't call direct. We go through the US government and the Pentagon largely is procuring on behalf of Ukraine what is being provided in aid. And that's how we do most of our foreign business through the US government. Okay, but does the, the government knows all the things you already have, mm -hmm. but like, do you ever call them up and say, we have this new thing that's even better than what we had before and try to get them to buy some new things? Or is that how it works? We do. They set requirements, but we also offer ideas on technologies that they may not be contemplating that we think would be useful to solve their challenges. Okay. So for the Ukrainians, um, is there any price negotiation if you say the Pentagon well, this is what it costs, but we'll give you a discount because it's a good cause, or how does that work? No, usually prices are set well in advance of when the capabilities are used. And so those negotiations are rigorous and uh, the government operates on behalf of the taxpayer to make sure they get the best deal, but that's not relative to what's happening in the environment at the moment. Okay, so um, let's suppose that the Ukrainians need certain types of weapons. And you, do you actually have those weapons sitting in a warehouse somewhere and you ship them over there? Or how do they get over there? And where do you, do you have to make them specifically for the Ukrainians or you already have them sitting somewhere? Well, my CFO's here, so I would not admit to carrying a lot of inventory. That would be a bad business move. But the U.S. government does carry inventory. And for most of what's being provided to Ukraine right now, it is coming out of U.S. stockpiles. Okay, so are there any things that you can talk about that and be, are being used by the Ukrainians that have done well? Well, I, you read the news as I do in terms of what the Ukrainians are using and how well they're doing. I would say the most important weapon they have is the spirit and determination of the Ukrainian people, even more so than the arms that are being provided by the U.S. and their allies. Okay. Now, you are not banned from going to Ukraine. It seems like everybody wants to be in Ukraine these days. <laughs> I feel there should be a bumper sticker that says, Hong could be haven't been to Ukraine yet, but... Uh, <laughs> But um, have you been to Ukraine? 
I have not. Okay. And I, now's not the time to go though. Not to go. Okay. So right now, um, what was your assessment? You're obviously not in the military, but you must talk to people in it. What is your assessment of the likelihood that this war or special military operation is going to continue for quite some time? I don't know if I'm the best person to suggest what's going to happen next. I wouldn't have thought that Russia would invade Ukraine. Once it happened, I would have thought that it would have been weeks before uh, some peaceful resolution would have been reached. It does look like now this conflict is going to endure, unfortunately, and it largely is being driven by, again, the will of the Ukraine people to protect their freedoms. Now, the defense contractors, and you, and you're a defense contractor, some people would call you that, some would say aerospace defense company, whatever, what's the preferred terminology? Aerospace and defense is our industry, but Northrop Grumman is predominantly defense. Okay. So do the defense companies, the other ones, Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics, do you get together and say, these are the weapons we ought to try to have the Ukrainians use, or you, you can't, for antitrust reasons, get together so each of you deal with the Pentagon separately? We absolutely collaborate under the direction often of the US government. Uh, and there are forums where we come together with the government to talk about how we can work together to either scale. Right now, it's a question of how do we scale production to backfill stockpiles. We also work together on new technology development. It's an, a rare industry in that competitors often team together because no one company has all the skills and technologies available to them to deliver on the government's tough requirements. So quite a bit of collaboration in our industry. So Congress very often uh, promotes certain aerospace defense projects and so forth. In this particular case, is Congress promoting certain weapons or certain um, products you have, or do they just coming from the Pentagon in terms of what you're going to be selling to the Ukrainians? Well, I wouldn't say they promote as much as they support through appropriations and making prioritization decisions about what uh, systems are most necessary for national security means. In the case of our international partners, our Congress also engages in codels that help to promote U.S. industry as a source, because we'd always like our allies to have systems that can interoperate with the U.S. and that we are providing. So when the Pentagon says we need certain systems and weapons for the Ukrainians, um, do they, and it's an emergency, do they pay you before you actually deliver the systems or do you have to, do you insist on getting paid first or you can trust the government's credit? We, we trust the government's credit. We and, rarely in the U.S. get paid first. Oh, you don't get paid first. And, and so are they pretty reliable? They pay you in three months or? They pay six? us on time. On time, okay. Usually. Usually. <laughs> Except during continuing resolutions. <laughs> okay. So uh, right now, I, for a while, there were three of the largest uh, aerospace defense companies were led by women. Uh, Marilyn Houston was running Lockheed Martin. Uh, Phoebe Novakovic was running um, General Dynamics, and you're running Northrop Grumman. So is there a discrimination against men that try to run these companies? <laughs> or why, what about affirmative action for men? Well, I think in all of our cases, we were the first woman right. in company histories of nearly 100 years. So we have some catching up to do still. Okay. And uh, do you get tired of getting asked every day, what's it like to be a woman heading an aerospace defense company? And if not, can I ask that question? What's it like <laughs> to be a woman heading up an aerospace defense company? I had a feeling you'd ask anyway. Uh, okay. You know, I don't think of myself as a woman running the company. I think of myself as a leader with a tremendous amount of responsibility to the people that I support. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk about how you became a leader. Um, I didn't want to make fun of Smithburg. I assume it's a great city, but um, I've actually never... Town. Town. Um, it, where is it, actually? It's just outside of Hagerstown in the, the hills. I would not call them mountains. Uh, that you cross over as you head into Western Maryland. And how did your family get there? Not that it's not a good place to be, but... Uh... <laughs> well, my father came from an even smaller town called Middletown, because it's positioned between Frederick and Hagerstown. And my mother came from an even smaller town called Clear Spring, Maryland. So they love small towns. They love small towns. All right. So <laughs> you, uh, what did your father and mother do in Smithburg? 
So neither of them had a college degree. So my mother worked in a sewing factory and my father was a surveyor for the county government. Okay, and so you grew up there and you went to high school there? Mm -hmm. And were you uh, president of student government or you the head of the Aerospace Defense Club or something? <laughs> I don't think we knew how to spell aerospace and defense in Smithsburg. Uh, I was active in my school, both in sports and extracurricular activities, but nothing that would prepare me for my okay. career. All right, <laughs> so um, if you're a student, if you grew up in Maryland, your parents are not wealthy, you can get, a, I guess, some state discount if you go to college in Maryland, but you went to college in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, so why did you pick Virginia and why did you pick James Madison? Did you admire his work on the Constitution or how did you happen <laughs> to pick James Madison University? Well, it was pre-internet, so I was somewhat limited not having parents who knew the college scene and coming from a small school where the guidance counselor didn't send many people to college at all uh, to get a four-year degree. So I had just done my own research and found James Madison to be the kind of culture that I wanted in a university. It was very oriented toward teaching and still is today. And I value the education I got there because the organization was not focused on research and corporate partnerships. It was focused on the student. Okay. So after you graduated, did you work right away or did you get your MBA later? I went to work and about two years into my career went to get my MBA. Okay. So you went to General Electric initially? I did. And did you ever think that your company would be more valuable than General Electric would be? <laughs> No, I did not think that. So, uh, okay, so you worked for General Electric, and then how did you wind your way to get to Northrop Grumman? Mm -hmm. So I left GE a little less than a decade into my career there to go to a small startup. And it was around the time of the internet boom, and I wanted to use my technology skills to help companies figure out how to monetize the internet, and that's what we were doing. 9-11 hit, and I had a team working in New York City in the financial district, and really our whole company was touched by that experience. We fortunately didn't lose anyone in the 9-11 terrorist attacks, but our world was turned upside down. And so I was asked if I would, in the company that I was working for, go work with the intelligence community for a short period of time on information sharing. And I said, absolutely, I want to do my part. And I thought I'd do it for 18 months, two years, and then go back to what I was doing, what I knew. And the rest is history. 20 years later, I'm still in the industry because I believe and I have a passion for the work we do. Okay. So to have the job, well, let's finish up. So you, you joined Northrop Grumman. And did you say, I'm going to be the CEO of this company someday? or? No, I never set, I set goals for myself. I wanted to have increasingly uh, significant impact in the companies in which I worked, but I never said I need to be CEO one day. All right, so, but you weren't surprised when you were picked as president and chief operating officer. <laughs> the writing was on the wall at that point. Okay, yeah. all right, so when you became the CEO, um, then all of a sudden you have to get all these security clearances, right? Do you have all the clearances you can possibly get, I guess, by now, right? I had a lot before I became CEO, but yes, it does feel like they just keep coming. And the government goes back and investigates everybody you've known since mm -hmm. the third grade and all that. Yes. And there were no scandals, no skeletons. It was perfect. Not that they could find. No. Right. Okay. And none that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk about your company. It has four segments, you would call them, right? Yes. So first is aeronautics. What is aeronautics? What is your, what is your aeronautics segment? It's pretty simple. We build aircraft, both unmanned and manned aircraft. Unmanned, is that like a drone or? Mm -hmm. And the unique aspect of what we do, there are many remotely piloted unmanned aircraft. Ours are completely autonomous, meaning they fly themselves. So sometimes I've read that autonomous kinds of planes like this, they actually have people that could be in any city just directing them. So what is to stop uh, a foreign country from doing the same to us. They could send their equivalent drones over our airspace. Is, is our technology so much better that nobody else can do that right now or somebody could do that? Well, that's where we need good defensive systems. And so that's another part of the business that detects and can deter or intercept if needed. So what's the future of drones? I mean, we already know what they kind of can do, but what can they do in the future that you would say would be amazing? 
what we'll see more of in the future is unmanned and manned teaming, meaning unmanned aircraft where you don't want to put humans in harm's way will do missions that uh, clear the path for or collect intelligence for manned aircraft that will follow. Okay. Now, another one of your segments is defense, mm -hmm. since the whole company is defense, but what is the segment of defense? It's largely our weapons business, as well as our command and control business that does the detection to support the intercept with kinetic weapons. So is that like another way of saying cyber or that's not? No, that business isn't cyber, that's it's more it. kinetic. So the physical okay. weapon okay. systems that we build. All right, now you make the B-2 bomber. We do. And which segment is that in? Arrow. That's arrow, okay, but you were talking about all right, so it's more, it's manned flight it's, as well as, okay. It's an airplane that is both conventional and nuclear arm. Now the B-2 bomber is famous for being a stealth. It is. So, but you can see it when you go look at it, right? You're near go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not and close. now you have a contract to build a new one. I think it's uh, a new stealthier plane, I guess, yeah. better or something. When is that going to be ready? Soon. We just moved the first test aircraft out of production and into test, and we have five more on the manufacturing floor. And without violating national secrets, what's it going to do that the other one can't do? <laughs> uh, it'll just be more stealthy and more capable, and I can't go into details of what uh, capable means, but if you have ever seen a B-2, you actually don't see it, you hear it when it does a flyover. It was at the Super Bowl two years ago and the media coverage tried to capture the B-2 flyover, but you really couldn't see a thing. Uh, and so that's what you'd expect with the B-21. Now, the B-2 bomber was pretty expensive per copy. Mm -hmm. This, is this the B-21 or what, what is it? The B-21 is the new one. Okay, the B-21. So, the B so as, how much is that going to cost? Like $50 million a piece? A little more than that. Uh, more, more than that? Uh, Maybe. But, but it's meeting its cost target. Okay, but uh, and the government of the United States has already authorized enough for them to make it worthwhile to do it? The program of record is 100 one of the challenges with the B-2 is it went into production in the late 1980s. And of course, the U.S. government decided to buy far fewer when the Berlin Wall came down. And so it did increase the cost on a per quantity basis of the B-2. We don't expect that to happen with B-21. OK, so you're going to make 100 of them, more or less. At least. And where do you manufacture them? In Palmdale, California. OK. All right, so another one of your divisions is your missions segment. What is that? Mm -hmm. That business is cyber, communications, and sensing. So think radars and detection systems. So is our cyber capability as good as the Russians? I'd like to think so. Okay. And um, can you give us any secrets about what we do in cyber or something? No, you might end up on that sanctions list if you okay. keep asking me questions. I say, like yeah. This. So, but um, so that's largely cyber, and cyber is is um, offensive and defensive, and you do both. We I, do. Okay, and your other segment is your, um, I guess it's the defense segment. Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, defense I talked about. The last one is space. Space. Sorry. And that one also is pretty self-explanatory. We do national security space for the U.S. Department of Defense and the new Space Force. We also work for NASA as we continue to explore the universe. We just launched a space telescope that is now a million miles from Earth and is going to look back at the first light around the time of the Big Bang. Uh, what, really exciting. And that one is called the Webb? The James Webb Space Telescope. And is it operable yet? Is it open? It is. It's still calibrating to be able to see back in time. Basically, that distance requires it to be cooled to very low temperatures. And so we're still calibrating it. And we expect to see first light in the May-June timeframe. So really soon. All right. So why do, should we care what the universe looked like uh, 5 billion years ago? How is that going to make our life better? Well, some scientists have dedicated their life to understanding the origins of our universe and exploring whether there are life-sustaining uh, okay. exoplanets other than our universe. Well, let's suppose there are. Is that why do we care? Does it make a difference? Because we're not going to really be able to communicate with them, presumably. But 
you've should... studied history and right. not science. But if okay. you've studied science, these are the questions that will help us rewrite textbooks about science okay. and All right. <laughs> discovery. All right. So um, now do you work with SpaceX? We do. And you've never met Elon Musk? I have. And what was that experience like? He's a, a brilliant man. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, are you surprised that a, a kind of startup company like SpaceX became so big so quickly in the space business? I'm not surprised. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity in space, and we're just scratching the surface of it. And of course, SpaceX is very much focused on commercial exploration of space, and that part of the market is in its infancy. Okay. So in your space business, you bought a company in the Washington area called Orbital. Yes. Um, do you usually buy those kind of companies, or you build things... Uh, internally? We do both, but when we have the opportunity to do high quality acquisition as Orbital ATK was, that's a faster way to accelerate our progress in key markets like space. I see. Let's talk about COVID for a moment. So when COVID hit, uh, were you running your company from home or how did you deal with that? Very briefly, we asked our senior leadership team and anyone who didn't need to be in the offices to stay home so that we could take the time to put in place safety protocols, more distancing. But the work we do really does require us to be in our facilities, either because it's classified or we have people building product. And for national security purposes, we had not only an exemption, but a request by the US government to continue doing our work. So we very rapidly, within a matter of weeks, had our senior leadership team back in the office. I have been in the office consistently since April of 2020. And have you, did you get COVID? I have. Yeah. Oh, really? Yes. How did you get it if you were mm -hmm. precaution? I don't know how I got it. I've had probably you know, two dozen close contact situations that I'm sure many in this audience have had over time. And I had very mild symptoms. And of course, I quarantined and stayed home. Okay. So going back to the workforce, do you, is it, are you having troubles and others in the aerospace defense industry getting employees to come in and work at the jobs at the, pay, at the wages you're paying? Is it a problem in terms of labor availability? The labor market is very tight right now for all skills, whether it be technicians, which for us is largely high school graduates that we put through training, through engineers who have advanced degrees. And what we are finding is that our attrition is only up slightly from pre-pandemic levels and we're able to hire, but there is wage pressure. And who are the better young employees, women or men? <laughs> well, we look for a very diverse workforce. So we want okay. to have our company look like our communities. Okay. And so today, um, are you asking your employees to come back to work five days a week in the office or three days or four days? What is your system? The majority are back five days because they need to be to effectively do their work. But we do provide flexibility to people who have circumstances that make that difficult or whose work allow them to have maximum flexibility. So you have insights, I presume, on the U.S. economy because you're selling things uh, throughout the country, out the world. So what is your assessment of the U.S. economy at the moment? Mm -hmm. Well, I expect growth will continue to slow, whether we'll technically go into recession, and if so, when, I won't try to predict. What I will say is that in our industry, we see a steady and increasing demand signal. So our challenges are more on the supply side, inflation, supply chain availability, and labor. So a little bit of slowing in the economy to get the supply and demand in balance is not a bad thing. Uh, your supply chain, does that extend to countries like China? Do you buy things from China as part of your supply chain? We do not. Most of our contracts prohibit us from sourcing oh. from countries like China. And you can't sell anything to China, I guess, we without don't. the U.S. government giving you permission. Right. So uh, today, um, the biggest challenge that you think the United States faces in the um, global arena, is it what? Is it cyber? Is it traditional military type of attacks? What do you think are the biggest challenges the, the country faces militarily? Certainly the speed at which technology is advancing. I think of us less in an arms race today and more in a technology race. 
So as other nations develop capability more so than capacity, our ability to stay advanced beyond their technology is first and foremost. And that's in domains that are less advanced, cyber being one of them, space being another, and also working under norms that the US government would want to operate under, but that all nations do not operate under. And we see that with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I would say that's our largest challenge is technology race and then standards and policies and norms that govern behavior. Now in your current position, uh, you have to deal with the US government. The US government is your biggest customer, right? Is it more than 70% of your it sales? Is. It's actually more than 80. More than 80%. Mm -hmm. So I guess you have to be nice to the customer, right? <laughs> yes. So how often do you have to see the Secretary of Defense or the head of procurement? Do you go there every week and say, here I am, and here's our new products we have? It's not every week, but it's frequent. And particularly since the crisis in Ukraine, we've had more engagement with the Pentagon around their strategy and how we as an industrial base can be ready and supportive. And what about, uh, do you deal with members of Congress? Do you find that uplifting or how, do, how does that? <laughs> I do engage with Congress and I will say that I appreciate members' willingness to serve. We need good leaders in Congress and I appreciate that it is a hard job and that we do our best to support and inform the decisions they need to make. But some people say that aerospace, or not the aerospace, the defense budget is very high. Mm -hmm and maybe it's too high. I assume you don't agree with that. Well, I don't, because if you look at historical trends, the percentage of GDP that we're spending on defense has actually come down significantly over the last several decades. And in particular, the amount that government spends on research and development in this country is about half of what it used to be. Now, fortunately, companies, ours being part of that, but tech companies and other aerospace and defense companies have made up the gap by increasing R&D spending during that time. But it's important that our government be behind research and development that provides the asymmetric capability that we need to stay ahead of competitors. Now, suppose the president of the United States called you and said, we've never had a woman serve as secretary of defense. And at some point, I'd like to appoint a woman to be secretary of defense and I'd like you to be that person, what would you say? I would applaud his efforts, give him some suggestions and let him know that I'm busy right now. And you wouldn't be interested, okay. And um, why do you think it is that, uh, you know, there's some industries that are not that popular. Um, some might say uh, pharmaceutical is not that popular. Some might say my industry, private equity is not that popular, but some people would also say aerospace defense is not that popular. Why is that? I think it's a misunderstanding of the industry. When you look at an aerospace and defense company, if you want to see a company that would profit off of conflict, I can see where that would be a negative perception. It's not at all uh, what our company seeks to do. We and the countries we work with are seeking to deter conflict and projecting strength is necessary to deter aggressive behavior. And so I'm very proud of the work that we do in that regard. And I think if more people understood that, they'd have a different point of view on the necessity, the intent, and the nobility of our industry and our work. Okay, so as you um, look at your product base, you would like to sell more, more products, I assume, to people overseas that are friends of the United States. Is that a major effort to try to sell products to other uh, friendly countries, or is that hard to do? It is because it's important for other countries to do their part in the collective defense globally and securing democracies, but it's also important that they are able to defend themselves. And so we see that as an important part of our work. We often though in Northrop Grumman are working on some of the more classified, more sophisticated capabilities that the US government does not allow export. So we're not gonna have 30 plus percent of our portfolio exported. We're at about 15%, and that's probably where we'll stay for the foreseeable future. It doesn't mean that we aren't supportive of our allies. We absolutely are, and there's a good bit of our product that can benefit them. But we also want to make sure that the U.S. has capabilities that are unique to our country. So can you tell us about some um, future, futuristic kind of defense capabilities we might have? For example, will we actually develop... Uh, a uh, 
hypersonic missile ourselves. I guess the Chinese have one and maybe the Russians have one and maybe even the North Koreans have one. Mm -hmm. So uh, how come we don't have one? And is that something we should be having? Well, we are working toward hypersonic capability. And I think it's a difference in concept of operation more so than a technology limiter. We have the technology to build a hypersonic weapon. And to the extent that the US determines that that's gonna be a priority, we will have the ability to scale and build more of them. Sometimes people say that the aerospace defense industry makes products, but they're taking a long time to actually get those products to market. Is that a fair criticism or you think it's just a misunderstanding of how difficult it is? We can move quickly when we need to. I am reminded of our history in World War II. We went from design of an aircraft to production for the F-6 in 18 months. So yes, today that process would take seven to eight years. But if we had the will to accelerate, we absolutely have the capability as an industry to do so. So if some young person is coming out of college and they have a choice to go into, let's say, private equity or aerospace defense, why would you recommend aerospace defense? Is well, a, while private equity is a very noble calling, I do think that the work we well, you do- you were in it, weren't you? Weren't you in the venture business at one point? <laughs> for a short period. You were a little bit. I, I didn't, I wasn't as successful as you, so well, I had to go were, try but I thought something you were, else. You were in venture, I thought, no? <laughs> I was, for a and, short And period. so you support carried interest, I assume. I, I do, <laughs> yes, very much so. Okay, um, oh, all right, so why should somebody want to be in the aerospace defense industry? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you why I'm in it. And I wasn't for the first you know, 10 plus years of my career. But when I came into this industry, I realized that there was more to my work than working for returns. And it was about doing work that would make a difference in the world. And I'm not naive. I know that the difference may be small and particularly when I first started in this industry, the impact that I was able to have but I wanted to leave this world a better place for my children and thought if I can do that through my work, not just through philanthropy or work that I can do in the community, that would really be meaningful to me. So that's why I'm in the industry. Okay, so uh, you're a role model for many women and maybe others as well, men as well, but certainly women would say you wrote, you've risen up to be the CEO of one of the biggest companies in the United States. Do you take that responsibility seriously and you, you speak to young women's groups, try to encourage them to come into your industry? And, and what's the challenge of being a role model? You can't make any mistakes and you can't uh, you know, curse at somebody or something like that. Well, there is a lot of responsibility and I'm humbled and honored to be thought of as a role model. I don't think of myself in that way, but if I can inspire someone to believe in themselves and pursue a dream, I'm you know, just thrilled that I can have that impact on someone. I think it's important for all of us to realize that we can through small acts really have an impact on the world. And so I do try to be a role model, but to your point, you're gonna make mistakes along the way. You can't be afraid to make mistakes along the way. And I think that too is part of being a role model, how you respond when you do and pick yourself up and move forward. Okay, so in your spare time, when you're no longer able to travel to Russia and you therefore have more time, um, what do you do? Do you, are you an exerciser? Are you a golfer or a tennis player? What do you do? Well, I'm trying to brush off my golf game. After I had kids, I put that on the back burner, but uh, my husband's playing more at golf and I love to do that with them. I also like to cook and I've found it's important to instill that skill into my family. My husband is learning to cook and he's improving every day. It's not something he ever spent time okay. doing, but he actually enjoys it now. So it's something we can also do together. Have you ever heard of Uber Eats or something? You don't. I have, I have, and honestly, my cooking happens usually on Sunday afternoons, but it's okay. just a nice distraction. Isn't it getting for late me. for him to learn how to cook? For I mean, after all these years, he learned how to it's, cook. He's enjoying it. Okay, and so are you a scratch? Don't deter him. Okay, I won't. <laughs> so are you a scratch golfer, or are you anything like that? No, no. Maybe once I retire and I can play every day. Right now I'm you know, playing twice a month, so it's not like my skill. Well, there's there's some people that say the lower the handicap of the CEO, the lower the stock price. You well, know, that. then that's not a goal I aspire right, to. Right, right, okay, so, uh, so keep your handicap high. It's, it's high, trust me. <laughs> so um, 
Your company was based in uh, Los Angeles for a long time after it merged with uh, Grumman. And uh, then you moved to the Washington area, like a lot of other aerospace defense companies. What's the advantage of being here? Well, you spend far less time on an airplane because our customer is here in the Pentagon on the Hill and I value spending time with them. And you need to be here in this community. And Washington is a fantastic community. So to the extent that we're working with customers who are based here, I think it's important that we be here and be immersed in the community as well. So you live in Northern Virginia? I do. So when you, um... Um, you don't go back to visit Smithburg that much, no. But, no, I don't. But I mean, I assume you're like the most famous graduate of Smithburg High <laughs> or something like that. I, I'm guessing, but I don't know that they keep those records. Okay, so when you go, you go shop, can you have time to go shopping? If you go to uh, Tyson's Corner shopping, do people know who you are? Do you have a big phalanx of security people trailing you or you just show up at the Whole Foods and buy and stand in line with everybody else? Yeah, I, I do the really? latter and low profile. Really? I mean, nobody, does anybody come up to you and ask for a job or a, or a weapon or something? <laughs> Every once in a while, a job or a photograph, but no, never a weapon. Okay. <laughs> We're not exactly a household name because no one buys our product other than the government. <laughs> um, okay. You don't want to make any consumer products, right? For people no. like me to buy. No. You don't, what about, no. you don't make little drones for small people? No, no. Although I offered David to buy a Northrop Grumman aircraft because I'm quite jealous. He buys GD aircraft. And so I thought well, maybe I'd make a sale. He wasn't biting. Well, um, I don't know if I could get a pilot that could fly one of your B-2 bombers. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think we could put you in one of those, but we have unmanned what? aircraft oh, that fly themselves. I mean, what more could you ask for? I could probably do that if it's unmanned, I could probably <laughs> do that. So uh, what is the greatest thrill you get out of the current job you have? Is it serving the country? Uh, running a big company, being a role model, uh, dealing with people like me when they interview you. What, what, is, what is the biggest thrill you're getting? Well, this interview is up there, but I uh -huh. will say it's serving the country. It's why I came into this work. It's what motivated me to stay with this work. And it's what will keep me moving forward. And today, uh, you would say that the aerospace defense industry is, is in pretty good shape relative to the, the needs of the country. And you're not really um, thinking the aerospace defense is just under attack or being challenged? I think our industrial base is the healthiest in the world. It has consolidated over time because defense spending has come down as a percent of GDP and that consolidation has been a reflection of those conditions. So I think as we look forward, strong bipartisan support and a recognition that national security right. is a constitutional right for our people is important. And inflation, is inflation bothering your company? Are you able to increase your prices a bit or you can't do that too much because you have one customer and that one customer doesn't like that? We're really trying not to increase our prices because that reduces the buying power of the government and increases the burden to the taxpayers. So we have tools available to keep inflationary pressures at bay, but we can't uh, offset all of them. So there is some price increase necessary. And when you're running a publicly traded company, the analysts often care about only what you did the previous quarter. I guess you know, know that phenomenon. I have come to learn that. Right. So um, how do you deal with that? I mean, you're trying to build up for the long term and you have to worry about every quarter. So is that a, a pain to do that? Look, it's just part of how our system works. And so you have to recognize that's the case. But always I keep the long-term view and I have a fantastic board that gives us the flexibility to do that. We're in a long cycle industry. And if we manage to the quarter, we would not have the kind of performance that you outlined. Now you've got uh, about uh, 90,000 employees. Mm -hmm. So how diverse is your workforce or your board or your senior management? My senior management team is gender equal, 50-50. Uh, my board has strong both gender and racial representation, and we work on that every day within our company to make sure that our diversity representation mirrors our communities. One of the challenges in technical fields is that we don't have enough women interested in and pursuing careers in STEM, and so that's an area that our company is active in. It's a area that my husband and I are passionate about. We're sponsoring scholarships to really help drive more interest in STEM, but particularly for women. And where did you meet your husband in the aerospace defense industry? No, in college. 
Really? At James Madison. Wow, okay. So uh, today, what are you doing uh, in your company and you personally in philanthropy? Do you have uh, the company have philanthropic interests that you pursue? We do, we have a foundation. And obviously in recent weeks, we've committed aid to Ukraine, uh, to the Ukrainian people through the foundation. And we've also matched the gifts of our people. And I find at times like this, whether it's a situation of humanitarian crisis in Ukraine or when we had tornadoes and hurricanes rip through this country last year and some of our facilities and people were impacted, our team is incredibly generous, and so our company works to match those. And as I mentioned, my husband and I focus more on philanthropy related to STEM education and underserved okay. communities. Now, your mother is um, still giving you advice? She does. My mother lives with me, and so I don't have to go far to get advice on how to raise my kids, how to run the company, all kinds of things. She's, she's fantastic, a great idea person. Is she ever, ever wrong, or she's always right about what she tells well, you? Well, never. She's my mother, right? Okay, so, so, all right. So the final... But I don't have to listen to her anymore. Okay. I, I just take it in. So finally, the main message that you would like to let people hear and people watching... Uh, know about Northrop Grumman. What is, if you were to ask, uh, summarize Northrop Grumman in a paragraph, what's the most important thing people should know about it other than it's got a great CEO? Mm -hmm. We're a technology leader who is helping the US and our allies stay at the forefront of capability to protect uh, human rights and freedoms around the globe. And we're really proud of what we do. And you're gonna be doing this for the foreseeable future, not gonna to return to the private equity or venture capital world anytime soon? No, not in the foreseeable future. Okay. Although you did quite well, so I am okay. somewhat inspired. All right, well, look, I wanna thank you for what you're doing and thank you for a very interesting conversation and uh, appreciate it and uh, thank you. Thank you, David. Okay.